Okay, uh, welcome. Um, it, it, this is the, the latest in a uh, series of podcasts and videos that uh, Floyd Zadkovich uh, is running. Um, we have set this series up um, as a part of um, seeing what's happening in the world uh, with the um, uh, quite serious uh, crisis um, related to the COVID-19 um, and how that's impacting different parts of the world um, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased today to have with us on the show uh, Yasim uh, Megath um, who's a uh, uh, North African um, lawyer he's based in Tunis but handles work in a number of neighboring countries as well as Tunisia um, and uh, welcome uh, to the show thank you Luke welcome Floyd Zadkovich, International Commercial Lawyers. So um, I, I thought it might be uh, of benefit and use to, um, to talk to you today about what's happening in your part of the world. Um, before we get into the, the detail um, of the talk, um, perhaps if you could just introduce yourself um, and uh, explain some of the areas that you focus on um, as a lawyer. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm a Tunisian lawyer. Um, I lead uh, basically and mainly uh, with the marketing cases and uh, I uh, have in my team other colleagues with deals with uh, business cases and uh, we are now uh, leading with uh, 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 in uh, uh, foreign countries other than Tunisia and uh, we are developing our uh, firm in uh, that's uh, main and uh, that's objective. Okay and uh, what types of uh, sectors do you mainly deal with um, as a lawyer? Uh, Specifically, marketing cases and uh, also uh, uh, international bin uh, business cases. Okay, right. So you act for ship owners and PI clubs um, and other and charterers and other companies involved in the maritime sector. Uh, and do you also act for cargo interests as well and, and subrogated insurers in some cases? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it, so it's the full the full spectrum of um, or, or of participants in the maritime sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I think the, the first aspect to to kind of get into today is um, how are you? Uh, how are things in uh, Tunis with the um, the the crisis uh, from a health perspective and and, and then, then economically? Oh, you know, um, the situation is very difficult for uh, Tunisia and mm -hmm. even for Morocco and Algeria. You know, uh, uh, everything, mm -hmm. we can say that uh, everything is stopped now. All activities are stopped now. Uh, we are obliged to stay at home in the confinement and uh, even for example in Tunisia we have also curfew uh, to 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. so nobody no one can go out only we can uh, go uh, we can only do it for special things and uh, we need to have permission for that so we can say that uh, our business is stopping now. We can do nothing. Mm -hmm. We can deal with nothing, uh, waiting the disparation of this uh, virus. Right. So the the port has, has that closed down. Uh, is cargo still coming in and out of the ports in Tunisia? No. Uh, uh, there is uh, a permission for uh, cargoes to uh, to. To go to, to come to uh, Tunisian ports and right. even Morocco and Algerian ports, yeah. uh, especially for essential uh, 
goods such uh, such like foods and the medicines and uh, yeah. uh, special necessity for uh, for the people. But uh, what we say now with uh, these measures, uh, even if we want to work or if we want to do business, it would not be possible. And it would be very difficult. And uh, you know, for example, in the ports, there is a, re a real uh, uh, congestion of uh, containers because um, uh, formalities are stopped, and uh, we have real difficulties to to deal with this situation. Mm. And is that because um, some of the shore workers are not able to work, like stevedores? Or company freight forwarding companies, companies that are involved in taking the cargo away from the port, is that is that an element of the congestion? Uh, yes, because it is. Um, how to say it? Uh, you know, we uh, uh, we are ports agents in the ports are working with uh, intermittents mm -hmm. with half. Uh, with equip, so uh, 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 the people are reduced. The number of people are, uh, is reduced. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so that uh, everything is uh, postponed, and uh, we uh, we need a lot of time to make every measures, every uh, uh, formality, custom mm -hmm. formality, for example. Yeah. Etc. And what about um, quarantines? Are you seeing, um, uh, or is there a process for dealing with uh, vessels that are coming to the ports there in North Africa? And are there any quarantines being imposed by the local authorities, by customs, um, or waiting periods? Yes, they are not allowed to, to, uh, to go out of their. Uh, the ships. So uh, uh, even uh, the, the formality uh, should be uh, done with limited, strictly limited people. Yeah. And uh, they are avoiding uh, contacts. They make all to avoid contacts. Avoid contacts. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's a really worrying time, you know. We're we're seeing in in England um, and in the U.S. where where our firms are based that um, there there are a number of different facets to the complications that are caused by this crisis. Obviously, the most important um, is the health situation and uh, trying to stop the spread of the virus and dealing with um those that have um uh, that are exposed to the virus and particularly the vulnerable uh, people in society but then you know f flowing on from that there's the the economic consequences um and uh it it's really impacting all aspects of life um and the the economic contraction is certainly nothing it's nothing like i've seen in in my lifetime and i and i believe it's <laughs> many decades that prior to that that we've seen such a, a tight um contraction um i was it was curious to know uh, in england the courts and the us the courts are still operational um uh, they are not holding um hearings in person uh it, it's all being conducted on on a virtual basis through video conferencing or telephone uh, conferencing but you are still at least able to bring um, court applications and existing matters while there may be some delays are still moving forward um, what's the the situation in um, in Morocco and Tunisia Algeria in, in the courts at the moment well for the moment the courts are closed mm -hmm. we deal only with penal cases right yeah so cr Which, criminal uh, criminal type uh, cases criminal yes criminal mm -hmm. cases uh, 
specifically or especially for uh, uh, arrested people and uh, okay. very, very emergency cases. Sure. Um, but uh, civil claims like arresting a ship or, or cargo um, and th those types of claims at the moment, the courts are closed for bringing those types of actions. Is that right? Uh, you know, they say, uh, we are now we are current, uh, currently now, the government is taking uh, new measures. Hmm. Uh, before we said before, they said before that uh, we could take uh, emergency measures like uh, that uh, chips arrest or, uh, or other things like this. But uh, practically, actually, we could not do this. Mm -hmm. Because you know, when uh, we find that uh, uh, the courts are uh, are closed, are practically closed. So when we go to the court to get to have a ship arrest, we find no one. You know, <laughs> we need to court to find the judge to, to give us this order and to find the clerk to, to, to for uh, preparing it. When we we, we we cannot find them, yeah, that's the problem. Mm. So it would require um, visiting a judge um, at his home or so, or her home or something like that mm. to try yeah. and get the order issued, which you, you and I, we've dealt with, you know, so many vessel arrests over, over the years. Um, and, and that's how we've come to know each other. Um, in that uh, often arrests are needed over weekends and, um, you know, at, at odd hours. So, um, often courts do have a mechanism for um, granting orders um, outside of the usual working hours. Um, but these, these are exceptional times, I imagine, and uh, I, I can see that clerks and judges might be reluctant to have contact um, uh, in a face-to-face in -face, uh, situation um, with lawyers. Uh, so, uh, is there any mechanism for holding virtual hearings or um, electronic filing of documents in, in, in your countries? Unfortunately, we have not yet such mechanism. Yeah, yeah. We right. were working on that uh, this last period, but uh, with this situation, all things is stopped. Yeah. So uh, now, actually, we have not yet this mechanism, unfortunately for us. Mm. And I, I perhaps know the answer to this question, but um, do you have any um, thoughts on uh, when things may change at, at all? Um, with um, the, the lockdown, has there been any discussion about lifting um, the shutdown period yet? For the moment, the confinement is programmed until uh, April 20. Right. But uh, this, uh, it, it, it could be uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, it could be uh, deferred to a later date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. until when this virus disappeared because we could not go out since this virus exists. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the same here uh, in London and also in, in New York and other places where um, at the moment, at least here in the, in, in the UK, um, the, uh, the lockdown period has just been extended for, for three weeks running into May. I think that's similar to um, a number of countries in Europe. And um, we really don't know how long it's going to last. There, there are practical issues as well. Like we have um, the, the children are not at school. The schools are closed. Um, so, you know, we have, have the children at home. Um, 
and uh, juggling work and, and family life. And I would be very surprised if schools reopen before the summer, which means you know, it, we're looking at having, um, and, and I mean, as a society, um, the children at home for uh, three or four months. And that has an impact um, economically uh, uh, in its own right. Um, so look, I think there's, it, it's, it's about different phases. Hopefully we can get through um, the, this initial phase and contain the virus. There's always the worry that um, if we open back up too early, it might, there might be a second wave of the virus and then we're just prolonging the, uh, the, the economic consequences of, of this. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's a, a question of dealing with the phases as they happen. Um, one, uh, um, aspect of all this that we have seen already uh, are companies that, um, are facing a liquidity, um, crisis, uh, and that their incoming payments have, um, dried up. And um, in many cases, they're unable to keep their business going for a variety of logistical factors. And we are already seeing a number of bankruptcies and um, cases involving arrests and attachments where it's possible to get those. Um, I should say most of my clients um, do not want to take those types of steps. They want to try and work with their commercial partners to uh, find a solution. Um, but in a number of cases, uh, they are having to do so and protect their position um, on, on their contracts. And so I thought it might be useful if we just um, uh, touch on what is possible um, in Tunisia, in Algeria, Morocco, in a general sense, um, in terms of arresting vessels or cargoes or those types of actions. Um, I know it might not be possible to do that right here, right now, but as things reopen um, in the coming weeks and months, uh, it might be useful for our audience to know what is possible um, in your part of the world. Um, so can, can, you, can, you can obviously get a vessel arrest um, in those countries. Um, what, what are the, um, the, the main requirements um, to be able to bring a vessel arrest um, in those Northern African countries? For the moment, uh, we, can, we could not predict anything, frankly. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said before, for the vessel arrest, uh, it is possible, okay, but uh, actually when we try to do it, it would be very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm thinking about in, in the next in period. After, in the next period, frankly, we cannot predict anything because now we are talking about uh, force majeure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, you have also this, uh, uh, this, I think, this situation even in the UK or in the USA. With the force majeure, we, we cannot uh, uh, make people responsible for uh, not uh, respecting their commitments or engagement because uh, it's not their, uh, uh, it's uh, something is over their, uh, uh, their willing. So just explain that to me because in in England, force majeure is not a, uh, a legal concept of its own right. It is a, um, it exists only if the parties have a force majeure clause in their contract. Whereas I understand the civil um, systems, force majeure is a legal principle. Um, could you just explain how that works in, in your country? Of course, it's a it's it's a legal principle in our in our countries here, even in Tunisia or Morocco, in Algeria, when uh, people could not uh, uh, do their engagement or respect their engagement because of something which uh, is not 
of uh, under their uh, their power such the situation you know it's not uh, we, we could not predict this uh, situation before mm. so uh, the con uh, the contract uh, uh, the engagements which uh, were made before this situation right they they were not uh, able to know what uh, uh, to, to predict it mm. before Yes. It, yeah, I see that. And so that's, that's um, a principle that exists um, as a matter of law in those countries. Um, we often deal with um, disputes or claims where it's a contractual claim and that contract has a governing law clause in it. Um, it might be English law, it might be US law, it could be others um and uh, the the claim the underlying claim is arising as a matter of english law uh and that is a contractual claim and one party may wish to secure that claim um and bring uh, attachment or arrest proceedings in a jurisdiction where they can find assets of the counterparty um, and I, I would um, looking at it from an English perspective say that the governing law um, of the contract is what determines whether there is a claim or not and 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 that's where the merits of the claim lie um, if a party wanted to come to um, uh, Tunisia and bring arrest proceedings for that underlying claim, would the Tunisian courts look at that, um, look at that action purely from an arrest and a security perspective, or would they also look at the underlying claim as well? Uh, I think that uh, we should make uh, uh, specify the difference bef uh, between uh the arrest application mm. and the, the the claim the full yes. claim yes because here in tunisia even in morocco and uh, in algeria you know uh, uh, it is it is possible to to get an arrest order uh based on uh, on uh, bl or basis or uh, the main thing is that it concerns maritime debt. Right. Yeah. So it needs to and be the is, claim needs to be maritime in nature. Okay. Yeah. And after that, when and after we uh, when we get an arrest order, we should we have to go to uh, to make an application for uh, to apply for the full case the full claim you understand me so you to to bring an arrest proceeding an mm -hmm. arrest action you also have to commence a substantive action as well is, is that what after after okay yes. so and how does that to, to get how does that interact with the with the let's say hypothetically it's an english claim how how does the substantive proceeding in um Tunisia, how does that interact with the underlying substantive English claim? No, in Tunisia, the Tunisian judge apply only Tunisian law. Right. Okay. Especially uh, in uh, maritime maritime cases, because you know Tunisia has uh, uh, approved uh, homeboy uh, homeboy views. Mm -hmm. And uh, these uh, rules are uh, are policy rules. We so we have uh, the obligation to apply them, and uh, to, uh, even uh, it, it would not be possible to apply English law here before Tunisian courts. Right. So just so, so I follow um, the steps here. Um, if you are a cargo owner 
um, and uh, you have um, a, a claim for loss or damage of your cargo um, and you want to bring a claim under a bill of lading against the ship owner for that loss or damage um, and the ship is in Tunisia or in Morocco or in Algeria and you bring that um, arrest action against the ship in REM, uh, you have to then, as a matter of um, arrest procedure, you have to commence a substantive action in that country, in Tunisia, um, to maintain the arrest. Yes, of course. This, this substantial um, matter should be before Tunisian or Morocco and uh, uh, Algerian courts, when the arrest is uh, granted uh, by their courts. Okay. And we've, we've seen that many times and, and it raises an interesting argument because from an English law perspective, we would say that the bill of lading um, doesn't have to, but it invariably will incorporate an arbitration clause and a London arbitration clause. And um, that even in the hand, that bill of lading, even in the hands of the consignee, uh, the bill of lading holder is a contract between the, um, the consignee and the ship owner, the carrier, uh, to arbitrate any claims under the bill of lading in London. Uh, so there's an effective arbitration agreement, we would say, as a matter of uh, English law. And so if um, the consignee, the, the party who's received the goods and they're damaged or allegedly damaged, um, brings an arrest proceeding, which must also bring substantive proceedings in Tunisia, we would say that, that those substantive proceedings um, are um, contravening the agreement to arbitrate in London. Have you seen that type of argument um, uh, in, in the courts? Of course, we, uh, in uh, every case, we have found such situation. But the problem with uh, such kind of clause in the BL that uh, they don't um, uh, respect uh, humble views. Because I don't know if you know, uh, it, uh, there is a specific, uh, specific rules in, uh, in humble views concerning the arbitration clause. And uh, we should uh, say clearly in this clause that uh, it uh, binds the consignment. But uh, generally we don't find such words in the arbitration clause in uh, uh, in the BS. So that's that you're talking about what's actually on the face of the bill of lading? Um, yes, yes. Uh, and the, the courts uh, generally, w when they find that uh, the arbitration clause uh, mentioned in the BL uh, don't respect the rule, uh, humble views, mm -hmm. the specific mentions uh, as uh, provided in homo views, they reject it. Yeah. They and so that's an interesting one. So if you're a ship owner and um, you are regularly trading in, in this part of the world and you want to ensure that a consignee um, is bound by an arbitration agreement, then you need to have express words to that effect on the face of the bill of lading yes. and, and, and do so by reference to the requirements in the Hamburg rules. Yeah, of course. That's what is needed. If, uh, if you are shipper and uh, if you want to avoid the Tunisian or Algerian or Moroccan uh, ports. Yeah. And if um, taking the next step in, in that, if there's a, bill of lading that does not have um, sufficient wording and the, um, the courts, um, the Tunisian courts just proceed to um, uh, hold jurisdiction over that claim. Uh, under English law, 
we might be able to bring what's called an anti-suit injunction um uh, or so that, that would be an anti-arbitration injunction but uh, some proceeding to um stop the substantive action not the arrest action but the substantive action from proceeding in um in that foreign court um what would be the reaction of the foreign court to an english order injuncting that court from proceeding oh they find that uh, uh, such uh, decision uh, uh, doesn't bind them yeah that's what i would expect. they are not yes uh, they are not they, they feel that they are not uh, uh, obliged to respect such decision yeah exactly exactly that, that's been my experience as well and um uh, the countries that you work in are not the only countries around the world that um, uh, uh, respond in that way. Um, I know Brazil, for example, it has um, uh, similar requirements on the enforceability of arbitration agreements in bills of lading. Um, and where, when they're attempted to be incorporated through incorporation of a charter party, they invariably fail. Um, okay. And so if, uh, are there any so so that's dealing with um kind of cargo damage and loss claims if you have a um if you have a contractual claim let's say uh let's say it's a charter party claim of some kind so it's it's maritime in nature and um uh, one party owes the other party um uh, say to marriage or um, uh, off hire or you know, something like that, a, a, a monetary figure um, that's contractual in nature. And that underlying claim is subject to English law. Would it be possible if you could find some assets, whether it's a ship or cargo or bunkers, or some assets of your counterparty who owes you that um, that sum of money, would it be possible to bring security proceedings in Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria? Yes, it depends. If you have, for example, uh, a decision. Oh, okay. Yes, it depends. If you have an arbitration decision, for example, or even a decision from uh, uh, English court, uh, we have. Uh, uh, a specific procedure, procedure to make here before Tunisian courts to enforce this such decision. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, a recognition pro procedure, right, for yeah. such decision. And uh, once we get this such recognition, we could enforce it here in Tunisia on uh, the debtors' assets. Yeah, so that's a recognition and enforcement action. Do you yes. follow the New York Convention? Yes, of course, yeah. regarding the arbitration clause, yeah. yeah. Arbitration decisions, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking more... But let's, uh, let me say, and uh, even if you have, in the cases that you have not a decision. Yes, that's what it is. Yes, if you have not a decision, we could uh, at least have uh, uh, an arrest order if, uh, for example, the unloading or loading of goods were in Tunisia, Tunisian ports, for example, or uh, uh, port of Morocco or Algeria, and uh, in this case, we, we, we could have a, a, an arrest order, but it would be uh, uh, the creditor would be obliged to continue its procedures before Tunisian courts or Moroccan ones or Algerians. Yeah. You understand? So again, it requires um, some jurisdictional basis for the underlying claim in Tunisia or Algeria or Morocco. So there, ne there needs to be a jurisdictional basis to bring substantive proceedings in that country to maintain an arrest procedure yeah 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 okay so yeah I, and, and yeah I, i've seen that happen um many times before um which again it's a it's a 
it, for not the first time, it's um, one of the, uh, the complexities of maritime law um, when you're, and it's one of the aspects I actually enjoy in practicing in this area is that you're not just dealing with a contractual claim as you might in, the, in a domestic context. You have the underlying substantive action, whether it's in contract or tort, you then have overlaying that issues of jurisdiction and different countries may have a claim um, to that jurisdiction. You may have an interplay between arbitration and national courts. And then on top of that, and arguably the most um, important, is that you have um, the need to get security um, or enforce the award and judgment against, often against a counterparty in a different country. So in a domestic setting, when you've got two Tunisian companies, you would, um, you know, you would have certain mechanisms available to pursue them within the country and enforce a judgment and, and wind them up and all of that. It's more complicated internationally. So often we are looking to try and get um, security of some kind. And I, I can remember a number of cases where um, we have uh, had to look very carefully at the facts of the case to see whether there was some basis upon which we could bring substantive local proceedings such that we could maintain an arrest or um, maintain an attachment and then assess how that will impact on the underlying claim and is it is it worth bringing the substantive proceedings even if that's contravening the um the law of the contract elsewhere so that you stand a chance of getting some security and and often it is because it's such an important aspect and in this environment um that's that i can see after we get through the um the initial phase of dealing with the health crisis and the immediate economic uh, situation, um, I, I suspect over the next six to 12 months, there are gonna be uh, an increase in those types of, those types of actions. Um, I was wondering, did you have any, any questions for me, Yassine, um, from an English perspective or a US perspective? Yes, I am um, curious to know what is happening in uh, in the UK and even in USA regarding uh, uh, are there any measures for companies who are losing their business and for uh, even for people there? Are there any? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, there are, um, there have been, they're, they're, they're different in the UK and, and the US, um, but there have been um, uh, some very significant uh, government interventions um, economically. Um, in, in the UK situation, um, uh, from a business perspective, um, the government has rolled out a, um, a scheme whereby um, uh, companies can get access to loans without having to put um, put up personal guarantees. I think the threshold's two hundred two hundred and fifty thousand um, uh, pounds, and that that's a, a loan that is provided by a commercial bank, but it's backed by the government, and the government will pay the interest and. Um, the fees associated with that loan up to um, I think it's a one year at this stage um, so companies that are experiencing a short-term finance issue uh, can, get, can get that type of loan um, there there are other um, benefits being rolled out to individuals as well um, the, whether it's in tax relief or um, some type of payments uh, and also the government's very heavily involved in um, the health aspect of ensuring that there's enough um, that there's enough um, equipment and masks for the for the um, essential workers for the doctors the nurses um, doctors and nurses are still 
and other essential workers are still able to continue their work so that that is um, still happening. Uh, so yes, in, in the UK, there are, there, there are certainly packages there. Um, I think it's a developing um, uh, landscape and there may well be some more um, as, as it plays on out. And we know the extent of the issue and how long this is going to go on for. In the US, there has been one of the biggest ever um, uh, bailout packages, I suppose, or um, stimulus packages, uh, which Congress has, um, ha has agreed and, and issued. Um, one of those is also a, uh, for, for small businesses, a um, loan-based scheme. Um, in the US, they're talking about providing loans um, and, and, and we can apply for them as a small business where you can get some, um, uh, some loans that will be um, ultimately forgiven uh, by the government. Uh, the, those are, um, again, provided by commercial banks, um, but then backed by, by the government. And there's talk of those being forgiven such that they um, do not need to be repaid back in certain circumstances. And as with a lot of these things, there are a number of government requirements as to who can access them and in what circumstances. Uh, it's aimed at trying to um, maintain employment and keep businesses alive uh, through this period of time. So it's, it's like short term finance. Um, and as I say, in the US, there's this element of um, the debt actually being forgiven by the government, so you don't have to repay it. Uh, there's also a, a one-off payment that's being made to um, individuals. I think it's $1,500 um, that's going out to everyone. Um, and there are other, other types of... Um, uh, packages as well but the, the governments I think are very um, attuned to the fact that uh, small businesses um, you know they, they make up such a large portion of both economies I think in the US it's over 50% of the economy is based on small business and uh, employment claims have just gone through the roof um, it's been the highest jump ever in um, uh, workers applying for employment uh, benefits because they've lost their jobs in the US. And um, I suspect there's going to be uh, or have to be a number of um, packages to try and uh, get the economy uh, moving again. So yeah, the short answer is yes, Yassin. There have been some packages. What effect they will have long term? Whether they will be enough to get the economy moving again? Um, it's too early to say. Uh, and and um, uh, what we do know is that it's it's a very devastating time um, in both economies and, and globally. Um, so look, uh, Yassin, I, I wanted to thank you very much for your um, your time today. Um, I'm sending my, uh, my my best wishes and hopes to you, your family and uh, colleagues and everyone in Tunisia, Morocco and, and Algeria. Um, I hope you all stay safe um, and, and healthy and that we, um, we collectively come together through this crisis and help each other in whatever ways we can and, and hopefully are stronger on the other side of it. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time. It's me. I thank you very, very much for your time, for this, uh, for inviting me to uh, to contribute in this uh, uh, project, in your project, and uh, I hope safe for everyone, <laughs> for every, and uh, hope I uh, I get you, I catch you again by uh, by this the future days. Yes, definitely. All right, we'll um, we'll leave it there, and uh, we'll speak soon, uh, Yasin. Okay. Bye bye.